All right, so we're gonna do a little exercise here. Yeah, Crystal, I had it in high school. Uh, looking back on it, the uh, Miss Mary Bents, it's Strunk and White's um, Elements of Style, right? Which is a, a a book I do not recommend at all. I have a few recommendations. I'll give them at the end. All right. Yeah, that's good. That's very good. Um, Strunk was a uh, was White's professor at Cornell, and he had like privately printed his little tiny usage guide back at the very beginning of the night of the 20th century. Um, and white in the middle of the 20th century sort of touched it up, revised it, added a few things of his own and republished it. So, uh, but, and so it reflects a lot of the prejudices of, you know, a, a crotchety Cornell professor who grew up in the latter part of the 19th century. Um, <clears throat> okay. Here's the exercise. I'm going to give you this. There's more than one slide to this, but I'm going to give you a bunch of examples that are on the right. And I want you to decide for me. Oh, yeah, absolutely. No, you should totally be drinking beer. If I had beer, I'd be drinking beer. I don't have any beer, so I'm drinking whiskey. Um, so let's do answers in chat. I, I think there'll be too many of these for uh, polls. So what we want to know is, um, I've given you four possibilities here, right? Something can be both, can be grammatical, both descriptively and prescriptively, right? In other words, both the books and just native speakers, like, yep, that's fine. It can be totally ungrammatical across the board. It can be descriptively grammatical. Native speakers actually say these things, but the books disapprove, right? Theoretically, the fourth possibility, although it's kind of hard to see where you get that, something could be descriptively ungrammatical. Native speakers never say this, but the books tell you you should say this, right? So those are the four possibilities, right? So here we've got four things, right? Teresa ate dinner, Teresa ate. Teresa devoured dinner, Teresa devoured. What do we th what do we think about these? You think three of them are fine, okay, Kiwi? Which three? The first three. Mm -hmm. Is that is that the the general consensus? Yeah, <laughs> Jesus, what? Yes. So, uh, absolutely, yes. Um, the first three are totally correct. The third is fourth is not. Um, what I, I, I picked these to sort of give you a little preview, in addition to just talking about grammaticality, to give you a little preview of some of the stuff we're going to be looking at in more detail later, right? Um, so, with eight, with a verb like eight, this can be so. The first example number one is what's traditionally called eight is traditionally called a transitive verb. It has an object after it, which is called dinner, right? Uh, the second version, eight, is intransitive. So in other words, some verbs can either have an object or not after them. They can be transitive or intransitive, right? However, devoured, notice, um, has to be transitive. You cannot leave off that object, right? Teresa devoured just it's missing something, right? You know, we, we're waiting for the other shoe to drop, right? Um, so notice this is not... Uh, and food is probably is implied and devoured too, right? In other words, we can't explain the difference in the patterns because of the meaning of the verb, Right. This is an arbitrary fact about each verb that they have. They permit different patterns to come after them. Right. It's just one of those facts about English that you have to learn. It's not necessarily. Lo there's no logic uh, involved. Right. It's just usage. All right. Here are some more. Tell me what you think of these four. 
food is not implied and devoured. Um, I mean, eight can be used for things other than food, you know, as well, but it has, it does, it definitely, you're right that devour, it has more metaphorical meanings, but, uh, you know, it strongly overlaps with eight, so. <laughs> it devoured itself by waiting for <laughs> Yep. Okay. This one is another pretty straightforward one. The fourth one is weird. The question, though, is... Why isn't the second one weird? You don't think there's anything wrong with the last one? The short story wrote. So notice these pairs are, I mean, I chose these pairs to be, you know, to show you the same pattern, but the pattern works in one case and it doesn't work in the other. So the bellhop opened the door, the door opened. Um, th there's a technical name, which you don't have to remember for this kind of verb. They're called unaccusative verbs, where um, what's happening with it is um, the, the bellhop here is the actor in the sentence, right? And the door is what's traditionally called the patient. It's the thing that's being affected by the action. And for certain verbs, you can move that patient to the subject without having to change the form of the verb, right? It just opened. And these are what we call unaccusative verbs, but only a subset of verbs allow this. A verb like write does not allow this, right? Hannah wrote a short story, but the short story wrote, or a short story wrote, is ungrammatical, right? We just saw the door opened. Yeah. I mean, we use the door opened when the agent is either unknown or irrelevant, right? Um, I mean, it was opened by something, but we don't, we either, we don't just either don't know or don't care why it opened, Right. It's not necessary. So like you could say you could all say the pilot landed the plane or the plane landed. Right. Like if we're focused on the plane's action of landing, the plane landed is fine. We don't care that there's a pilot there. Right. So. animated storybook has taken to making more books the story wrote but you would have to say you would have to add something this to make it grammatically complete right the story wrote itself if you add itself you've added a direct object right and then it's then it's fine <laughs> stories don't write but they could i mean you know like i mean maybe i i could maybe think of a better uh, better example, right? But yeah, I mean, there there are a certain subset of verbs. There might be some semantic uh, thing to it, but uh, <laughs> all right. Next set of four for you. So, okay, uh, both, when you say is okay, Davey, do you mean both descriptively and prescriptively, or just one or the other? <laughs> you hate all of them. Yeah. Um, okay. You're allowed to hate, you're allowed to hate language while still recognizing that it's correct or incorrect. A native speaker would say three of these. Which three, Kiwi? Yeah, third one was a commercial. Exactly, Emmy. I can't get no satisfaction is also a song lyric. Absolutely right. Uh, don't nobody like me. Uh, I don't know if that is a song lyric or not. If I didn't pick it from that, I picked it from a famous 
uh, instance of um, child language acquisition. Number one is a Rolling Stones song, Messy. Yep, exactly. I can't get no. No, no, no. Okay. Um, so this obviously is a about how negation works to me. So, um, or works for English speakers. Um, the... <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> What does nobody have have against Sara Lee? Or um so the one that is three of these four are um well let, let's start with the uh, okay, three of these four are descriptively grammatical. That is a, a significant number of English speakers would say one or more of all three of those, and those are one three and four, right? Um, the only one that is prescriptively grammatical is uh, number three, right? And this is, it's prescriptively grammatical because this doesn't mean the same, this is not parallel to I can't get no satisfaction, right? When you say I can't get no satisfaction, you have to say, I am not a descriptively grammatical person, Tuffy. When you say, I can't get no satisfaction, no one in their right mind thinks that you actually mean, I get some satisfaction, right? Unless you use, you would have to go out of your way to use contrastive stress for that. Like, if you, if you went and said, well, it's not exactly true that I can't get no satisfaction, right? Then we sort of... We, re we, we reverse the negatives and we get, I get some satisfaction out of it, right? Um, but, you know, in a descriptive sense, I mean, prescriptively, it's disapproved of, it's multiple negation. Descriptively, it's incredibly common in the language, right? Um, now, don't nobody like me is also observed, you know, in English. Uh, also grammatically uh, frowned upon by standard language. Now, this one may be a little more, I mean, like many of you were saying, eh, I don't really like that one. This is not in everybody's, this is a less common construction than I can't get no, right? Um, <clears throat> the, uh, but it's still descriptively grammatical, prescriptively. Right Nobody doesn't like Sara Lee is prescriptively grammatical because the intended meaning of this is everyone likes Sara Lee. In other words, you know, nobody doesn't like it, right? Um, so that's following the standard rules of grammar. The multiple negation is, you know, gets confusing. Um, it's very easy to get yourself twisted up in knots with multiple negation. So, you know, you... The, if you're not following it, it's... Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because the multiple negation turns into a positive, because, the act, because they actually cancel each other out, it's acceptable standard English, right? Tano, there you go, yeah, yeah. If it follows that sort of logical thing. Yeah, yeah, multiple. Yeah, I, I told that joke on stream. Uh, for those of you who weren't there, I'll tell this. I'll tell the joke. The joke is... It's not actually, well, it is a joke, but it's actually a real, it actually happened. Um, there was a, um, uh, a lecture, a linguist was giving a lecture, at, uh, you know, at a, at a conference, and it made the point that there are some languages that, um, where uh, two negatives make a positive. There are some negative languages where two negatives may, uh, you know, are still negative, but there are no languages where two positives make a negative. And a guy in the back of the room piped up, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, um, now, to, to spoil the joke, I do have to point out that that yeah, yeah is 
uh, is sarcasm, right? And and in sarcasm or irony, verbal irony, you are using words deliberately to convey the opposite of what you're actually literally saying. So that's using a meta linguistic feature to you know sarcasm is sort of laid on top of the the basic workings of language, you know. So yeah, it's all about the tone, exactly. <laughs> um, so. It's it's a nice joke, but it's not actually, in a linguistic sense, a contradiction of the guy's point. So, now, I get any satisfaction is uh, ungrammatical. I'm not aware of any variety of English that would uh, say this. But the reason why I put this here was to sort of get you to think a little bit about this bias against multiple negation. This, this word any, when do you use any? Right? Notice, you can't say, I can't get no satisfaction in standard English because you've got the two negatives. You're supposed to say, I can't get any satisfaction. Right? Um, like, if, ah, but okay, so as soon as you add the if Kiwi, you've changed the grammar in important ways, right? Um, the, uh, you know, th this is a straight up positive context. The if is a hypothetical context, right? Hy hypothetical context and negative context. A any basically is limited to those um, things. You can say, I get, I can't get any satisfaction, right? But if you, if you think about it, if we have to use a special word in the negative context, I can't get any satisfaction that we can't use in the positive context, then we're not, in fact, adding um, just one negative word to the phrase. Any is a word that's limited to a negative scope here, right? So how much are we really like gaining logically by banning it? Um, another thing we're thinking about, for those of you who know French... I mean, think about standard French uses two negative words to create a negative, right? Like ne pas, or ne jamais, or ne rien, right? Uh, it's, I mean, now in, in speech, they're, they're in casual speech, one of the, the, the ne is often dropped, right? But, um, you know, so it's, it's ironic that in French, multiple negation is the standard and the single negative word is the more casual form, right? Uh, all of which goes to show whether or not, like, you know, like I said, the, this idea of multiplying two things to make a negative is a metaphor and you don't have to accept that metaphor, right? If you think about, um, yeah, if there is, a, again, notice it, it, you're in a hypothetical context, right? But even that, the I get any is kind of weird, isn't it? Um, I'll get any satisfaction that comes my way. Yep, exactly. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. I, Bins, you should. I'm not going to sing EFP off here, but yes. Je ne regrette rien. <laughs> Je ne ne parle pas parfaitement. Yes. <laughs> um, the the place I was going with this idea about you know, negatives reversing the meaning is sometimes they do. In some contexts, they do. In other contexts, they don't. Um, and this is it's certainly true in other languages like French, but in, um, in English, historically, and still in a lot of non-standard dialects, um, the... Uh, you know the, the a better metaphor for negation is not multiplication but addition right after all what do you get if you add two negative numbers you get a bigger negative number right um and in practice this is exactly how multiple negation is used by the people who use it, right? It's used to emphasize the negative feeling. I can't get no satisfaction is more emphatically negative than I can't get any satisfaction, right? Don't nobody like me is a more intense, um, you know, expression of existential angst at being, un, you know, having no friends 
uh, than just nobody likes me, right? Yeah, it's all just how, like, why is multiplication the, the necessary metaphor here, right? Um, and, and if you look at his, you know, English before about the 18th century, the, um, you know, it's, it's used that way by the great authors. Chaucer uses it that way. Shakespeare uses it that way. Yeah, for, 